Hi, this is Ivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Today's sponsor is the Baby Trend Cover Me 4-in-1 Convertible Car Seat. This car seat is so unique. It addresses the number one complaint by experienced mothers, which I believe I am, which is sun in your kid's eyes, which is something that, of course, drives them nuts. And you're not going to want to put, like, what baby sunglasses on. That's never really worked for me. Um, along with the canopy, the Cover Me has a usage rating from 4 to 100 pounds. So you can use it for a long time and can be used infant rear-facing, toddler rear-facing, forward-facing, and belt positioning booster. The Cover Me also has a very convenient recline system, which includes a zero radio base, an integrated recline flip foot. I don't exactly know what that means, but that's okay. The system allows the children to find a position comfortable to them and also limits the amount of space taken up by the seat when in rear-facing position. Basically, it's just an amazing car seat, and I wish I had had this when my kids were little enough to fit into car seats. It makes parents' and kids' life much easier. It's just amazing, um, and it has a UPF 50 plus on the canopy so your kids don't get a sunburn either. So your kids will love sitting in it. They can interact with everybody in the car, and it protects you both rear and forward facing. There is a special 20% off code, which is COVERME20, if you go to babytrend.com slash OSA, O-S-S-A. That's H-T-T-P-S double slash babytrend.com slash O-S-S-A and put in the code COVERME20, capital C, cover, capital M, me, the number 20. Also, I'm giving away one of these car seats. So if you or anyone you know is having a baby soon and would like a new car seat, which is something that you have to get when you, as soon as you're pregnant, um, I am giving one away. To win the giveaway, just write a review and give a rating to my podcast, preferably a five-star rating and a really nice review if you don't mind. Extra credit. If you do the same thing for my Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight podcast and my Moms Don't Have Time to Have Sex podcast, if you could do five-star ratings and reviews for all of those podcasts, oh my gosh, um, you will definitely be at the top of the list for entering this giveaway, and then we will pick at random. So enter the giveaway, use the code if you just want to get the percent off and order it right away, and again, baby trend, cover me, four-in-one, convertible car seat, go for it. It's June. Happy June 1st, everybody. Welcome to my June Book Blast, where I'll be releasing multiple podcast episodes a day, all based around a certain theme. And today's theme is Happy Pub Day. This is the Pub Day release for four books that are all coming out today, June 1st. Christine Mangan, Rebecca Stafford, Nicola Yoon, and Zakiya Harris. So enjoy today's June 1st Book Blast. Nicola Yoon is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Everything Everything, and The Sun is also a star. She is a National Book Award finalist, a Michael L. Prince Honor Book recipient, and a Coretta Scott King New Talent Award winner. Both novels have been made into major motion pictures. Nicola grew up in Jamaica and Brooklyn and lives in Los Angeles with her husband, novelist David Yoon, and their family. She's also a hopeless romantic who firmly believes that you can fall in love in an instant and that it can last forever. Her latest book is called Instructions for Dancing. Welcome, Nicola. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Instructions for Dancing. Thank you for having me. I am so, so happy to be here. Your book was so great. I mean... This it's basically like tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved again in a book form. Right. For yet YA for every I mean, it was like amazing. It was fantastic. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. You know, it took one billion years to write this book. <laughs> um, and it was a long journey, but I am very proud of what has come out. You know, I started writing it when my mom was very sick and my uh, my father-in-law was also diagnosed with cancer and he eventually died, you know, within a year. And one of the things I was struggling with when I was writing with this book is, you know, why do we love people and we know we're going to lose them, right? Like, why do we all do this? You know, ends, endings are painful 
right? And and everything ends. And so why do we as humans like commit our lives to this? Why don't we just like put ourselves in a little shell and hide away from the world? Because frankly, when I was going through all that stuff with my family, I really just wanted to. I just wanted to just hide away and love no one (laughs) ever. And I'm sure that everyone else has struggled with this feeling, right? Because we've all lost people and lost things and it hurts. Well, our interview is now over. That was so beautiful. We don't have to talk about anything else. Great. Thank you. (laughs) I am so sorry for all that you went through. And I read that in the back of your book. And I'm so glad you told the reader about it. I mean, that's like a great, you detailed your whole journey and how you had written another book first and decided that that wasn't going to be the book. And then you finally came back to this one. Even admitting all of that is in inside of this book is a, is a decision in and of itself. What made you decide to tell everybody about it? Why be so open about it? Or do you feel like it just gives it the context that you were hoping it had? Um, I mean, in my acknowledgments, I'm fairly open usually anyway. And it's funny because To me, I haven't, there's so much more to tell. So I just wanted to give a little bit of context for why this book took so long. (laughs) That's really what it was, because I think the question I get most asked by fans and they're teenagers and they're so wonderful and they're, they're like the best fans in the world is, oh my God, Nikki, when's the next book coming out? <laughs> and because my last book was in 2016 and, you know, in between the last book and, and this one, so much had changed in my life, just so many health issues in our, in our family. And I just wanted to say a little bit this is what was going on, you know, and like, and also the internet doesn't tell the truth or or we don't all tell the truth on the internet. Right. So like, I don't, I'm fairly private anyway, so I don't share all, I certainly don't share my family's health struggles (laughs) online. So I just wanted to say a little something like, you know, I know it took forever. Hopefully it was worth the wait. (laughs) Oh, I mean, I don't feel like that's forever, but I feel I can sense the pressure you're getting. I mean, after two number one bestsellers, people are like, all right, let's get going. But in truth, that's not that long to wait between books, is it? I mean, I don't know. It's really not, but, you know, book publishing is both like an art and a business, right? (laughs) So there is an extent to which you're just like, okay, where is your next book? And, you know, honestly, my publishers have been great and gracious. They're willing to wait for me. Like, you know, I I talk about the book that failed in between The Sun is Also a Star and Instruction for Dancing. And, you know, we could have published that book, but I don't, I didn't love it. I don't think anyone else loved it. I mean, it was good and competent, but it wasn't, magic, you know, or I didn't, I didn't feel the magic. And and I don't really think they did either. And so at some point I was like, I don't know if we should go with this one. And, and everyone was okay with that. And they were like, Nick, we'll just wait for you. And I was like, okay. So a lot of it, a lot of the pressure is self-imposed, unfortunately. I'm I'm feeling that. (laughs) I'm feeling that a little bit. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, this is also a great book for anybody whose family has had divorce in their family and who doesn't know sort of how to forgive because it's not just loss. It's also betrayal, Right. right? Like she feels so betrayed by her father and what does it mean? And, she, you know, of course it takes to like, I don't know, three quarters of the way through before she finds out why the, her parents really, you know, the real reason they got divorced or whatever. But, but still like when you are, when you have that main relationship with the father and the daughter and that trust breached it, you know, all the research says it it contributes to all subsequent relationships. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things I, I really like to do in the books is show that parents are just people and then they're also often very flawed, right? And so, you know, just like a little bit of the background of the book, you know, it's Evie. The book is about Evie, who is 17, and she loves her parents and she loves their relationship. And she especially loves her dad, but they get divorced. And they get divorced because the dad has an affair, right? And so Evie, who is like normally this very romantic sort of romance book loving, romance book reading and loving girl, becomes quite cynical. And on top of all that, she meets this sort of mysterious woman who grants her the superpower, although Evie doesn't think it, think it really is a superpower, where if she sees a couple kiss, she sees their entire relationship, right? So she sees the beginning of it, the middle, like sort of the exciting beginning in the middle, and then the inevitable end, right? And what Evie takes from this is that everything ends, 
And so forget about it. Why bother to get into relationships? And so through, you know, she's become quite cynical. And through all this, she has to learn to forgive people and to learn to live with the fact that things do end because that's just what life is, right? Like for for good or for bad, it's just true. Mm -hmm. And so that's the journey that Evie's on, right? Like, so including forgiveness, right? Because we all do make mistakes and we all do hurt each other. But the only way through that is love, right? So, you know, that's you got to learn. <laughs> Poor Evie. I like put her through the ringer. But she uh, seriously. To. But I love how you said at the end how it's, it's all about the wide open middle. And that's where you have to live because it's true for love. It's true for life. It's like, it's so perfect. And my favorite quote in your book was, the problem with broken hearts isn't that they kill you. It's that they don't. <laughs> oh my gosh. Right. I hope you have that like posted up somewhere or like put on something because it's so true. It's like, sometimes you wonder how you're going to get through things. You just don't even know. And, and yet you do and you have to. And so, and so you do. <laughs> you do, right? And and that's the trouble, right? And sometimes you just don't want to. And I actually remember exactly when I wrote that. I think I was in the hospital and oh. I'm working on this book. And I like I sometimes I mean I write in notebooks anyway, but sometimes I write out of order if I if something occurs to me. And I remember just writing that down and just sort of putting it like I and mean, I note to myself to come back to this quote for the book at some point. Oh. But Wait, yeah. so you don't you don't type your books? You know, I write into notebooks and then my first draft is in these moleskin notebooks. So like this thing, right? Oh wow. I write mm -hmm. into like 10 of them. And 10 of them makes one book usually. And then every few days I type it into the computer. And so it's my first revision. And I've always done it that way and I cannot get away from it. And I've tried and it does not work. Wow. Yeah. Doesn't it take a lot longer? I feel like it takes me so long to write. It does take a lot yeah. longer. <laughs> but I feel much freer when I'm just writing by hand because it just feels, I feel like a kid. Like I can just write anything. It's the, it's not permanent. You can just mm -hmm. cross it out. And so all the sort of, sort of weirder ideas occur to me when I'm writing in my notebook because I don't know. I don't edit myself. I don't censor myself in a way that I do on the computer. The computer feels a little bit more permanent to me. Huh. And so, yeah, I feel like just free. I can do anything. I can say anything. <laughs> well, I love all the tricks everybody uses to get themselves right. to write without, you know, that inner censor coming. If it on takes 10 moleskins, go for it. You know? <laughs> Whatever gets you to write is the thing that you should do. You know, that's what they always say. And in this book too, I was so sad about her abandoning her love of reading because of her emotions overwhelming her and how you have so much about romance books sort of woven inter, you know, interspersed, like in these short chapters, like designed to keep people's interest with different, like the way it's, you know, some, here's a quote, here's a text and here's this, and here's like the definition of, of different romantic relationships. And, and yet it all starts with like her, her feeling like, I, I forgot the quote, but something like words or books are just like letters on a page. And I was like, oh, that hurts my heart. <laughs> <laughs> like books don't work their magic on me anymore is, yeah. the, is the opening line. And it, you know, it's true though. Like, I mean, do you ever go through this yourself? Like where a phase where just like nothing is you know, whatever sadness is happening in your life, like nothing is penetrating, like you're trying to find your way through and the, the usual things don't work anymore. It's true. And that's where Evie is at, right? Like she loves books, she loves romance, but the magic is gone, right? Part of her journey is finding her way back to that magic. Wow. So Nicola, how did you get started doing all of this? How did you end up writing? I mean, I know now the story of this book, but just your whole journey to begin with, like, where did you, did you like to read it? Did you like to write as a, as a kid? Like, when did it start? All right. So I'll tell you my like ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I want it. I'm sorry if you're repeating yourself. You must tell people this a lot, but I'm so interested. No, no, no. Like, it makes me laugh when I think about it. Like, that's just the, the way things happen. But I did write when I was a kid, but I forgot for a long time. I was really good at math in high school and college. And so I sort of got sucked away into the world of engineering. I worked in finance for 20 years while writing on the side. But the thing that really got me back to writing is 
I went to Cornell for electrical engineering. And in your senior year at Cornell, they make you take something outside of your major. And so I took a class and I took creative writing because I was young and obnoxious. And I thought, oh, how hard could it be compared to like my partial differential equation classes and like all this stuff. And I took this class and it was the hardest class I've ever taken. It was I was just like, how could this be? And at the time, I was absolutely just in love with this boy who just did not love me back at all. Like, I was just suffering from unrequited love. And so I wrote bad poetry and bad one-act plays and bad short stories and bad everything about this boy, just everything about him. And my professor was this lovely woman, and she took me into her office hours one day, and, you know, she's like, you're going to get over this boy (laughs) eventually. But she told me that I had potential. You know, she really liked my writing, and, um, and she was right. Like, I got over the boy eventually, but I got bitten by the writing bug and it just stuck. And I credit her forever with, and I can't even remember her name at this point, I'm so old. (laughs) But I do remember her just like really looking at me and saying, you have potential and you should do this. And then I did. But, you know, then it was another 20 years before anything saw the light of day. It took a long time, but we got there. And why this genre? Like why... How did you end up here? I mean, a couple of things, right? I think that I'm quite a philosophical person. Like, and when I mean, what I mean is like, I am the person asking the question at the party, like, but what does it really mean, right? So it's kind of obnoxious, like I'm really irritating, but I really want to know the meaning of things, like the big grand meaning of things. And I think kids are like that. Like, you know, I think young adults are are naturally philosophical. I think they're very open to the world. I think they're trying to figure out who they are and who they want to be and the kind of person they want to be in the world. And I honestly think that most adults should retain this, but they don't, right? Like we should all be asking the big questions. Like we should all be trying to figure out how to be better and what is the meaning of life and does God exist? Like we should all be asking these questions. It makes your life richer. It makes you curious. Curiosity keeps you young. And so I think I'm, I sort of naturally fit with this audience because I think they're naturally very curious. And and I am also, you know, I just, I am this way. It's so annoying, but this is how I am. Like, I just can't let it go. I always want to know. I don't think it's annoying or obnoxious, P.S. <laughs> it, it's not. It's great. It's great to be curious and inquisitive and questioning. And I, I think it's, anyway, so stop with right. the disparagement. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair yeah but so the kids are, are like that and and honestly most of my readers are actually older like they're actually like between like 28 and like 34 or something like that and I do think they are curious too I mean I hope that what I'm doing is sparking a conversation with yourself right and I love being in conversation with teenagers because they're so open. And I want to say, look at this way of thinking about things over here and look at this way over here, because it's the first time generally that they're thinking about these things. And, you know, for me, it's like just a privilege to be in conversation with. Well, I have to say earlier today, I was on a call with two publicists, one of whom was like in her late twenties probably. And they were asking like who I had coming up or something like that. Anyway, I mentioned that I was interviewing you this afternoon and the one girl was like, Oh my gosh, I just reread her book again yesterday. She's amazing. Blah, blah, blah. I love her. And I was like, okay. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, she was very excited. I feel like I should have had her on here for the zoom (laughs) as well. Well, I mean, that's it's, I think it's a, all a great way to be, to question life and not take things for granted because, you know, life is short and you either acknowledge that in a regular basis and, you know, live your life a certain way or, or you don't. And I think if you do, you feel compelled to try to tell everybody else to live the same way and it either works or it doesn't, but at least you, you're trying to get the message out. So I totally get that. I mean, I think we all learned this this past year too, right? How things can just change, right? And I firmly remember being in Trader Joe's with my husband and thinking this was kind of a lark, you know, that Mm -hmm. maybe it'd be three weeks and we'd buy some junk food and we'd camp with our little girl. And it wasn't, right? I mean, it turned out to be so much bigger and there's so much loss and, and things change just like that. And you know, you got to pay attention. We don't, we don't get forever, right? So 
that he got to pay attention and, and try to live. I mean, and I, I say this as someone who is trying like that all the time and I don't always succeed, but I, I do try. Isn't there that saying like do or there is no try or something? Right. <laughs> do yeah. or not. Star Wars. Like, oh my gosh. Do- I am the last person on the planet <laughs> to quote Star Wars. But anyway, I don't know where that came from. You know, I started this community called Moms Don't Have Time to Grieve because I have four kids myself and I've gone through times of loss and tragedy and all this stuff. And it is so hard to keep yourself together and also have to be at least somewhat functional for all of the kids and everything. How did you manage that? You know, I think my instinct is to hide some of it from her. My little girl is nine, but they're so much smarter than we are <laughs> and so much more perceptive. And so I'm so, I try to hide, but I cannot because she sees everything. And sometimes I'm just honest. You know, mama is sad. Grandma is sick. You know, we debated for a long time whether or not to take her to my father-in-law's funeral and then ended up doing it. And, you know, we all cried like, in, you know, at the funeral and, and she understood in the ways that kids do, right? So they understand up to a point. And then I think their brain honestly protects them from like going too far down the path, right? Like she doesn't imagine her mom dying. She doesn't imagine her dad dying yet. She mm-hmm. will, but I think there is like a protective mechanism that sort of kicks in and to all of us, honestly. So I tried to be honest. I didn't, go down the full path with her because she's too young. But then I just let it happen, right? I mean, you just, I want her to know it's okay to be sad, Mm -hmm. I guess, is what I, because I don't want to be, you have to pretend that everything's okay all the time because I I feel like that's not good or healthy, but you can't tell them too much too because, I mean, anyway, I'm trying to protect her. Right. (laughs) Wow. Well, it must be neat for her to be growing up in a family with two authors. I mean, that's so great. I mean, if you're ever going to be in an environment where you have two sort of thinking, analyzing, observing type parents, I mean, I'm making massive assumptions based on the fact that you both (laughs) write novels, but that's like such a unique environment in which to grow up. What is that? What's it like? Like what's... We have a crazy household, honestly, like, because, because we tell stories all the time, we tell stories to each other and she does too. Like, if she doesn't turn out to be a writer, I think I'm <laughs> wrong about everything in the world because she's such a storyteller. And I think because, you know, David and I met in graduate school, the way we know each other is through storytelling, right? We were, we were in our first writing workshop together. I really admired how he wrote. That was like one of the things I fell in love with. I, I loved his writing. Mm-hmm. And so that's how we know each other. And so we're always talking stories. I am bouncing ideas off him. He's doing the same for me. She jumps in with her own ideas. Like She has told me things that have made it into the book. <laughs> so, you know, we just are a storytelling household. It's really fun when Penny's involved. But what's really great is when I'm suffering for writing, <laughs> right? So like I'm in the middle and everything sucks and I think I'm the worst writer in the world. I can go talk to David and he knows exactly how I'm feeling. And he will reassure me that I'm not, in fact, the worst <laughs> writer in the world. He knows the insecurity, right, and the self-doubt. So that's really good. And I don't know any other way of knowing him, right? We're just creative together. That's how it's always been with us. Oh, that's great. And your two, first two books have become movies. And I was like almost late to this because I was watching the preview and I was like, how have I not seen these movies before? And I was like, I have to pause the trailer because I don't want anything to be given away. And I have to like go watch this with my teen daughter this weekend. So <laughs> trailers, and like, trailers are like little movies themselves, right? They like do the whole thing. I'm just like, stop. I know, right? I'm like, no, no, no. Like give me like a 20 second trailer. Like I, I don't want, I always am stopping trailers early before. But that's such a neat thing, too. And I loved your little Instagram thing about, like, you know, version two of how a movie gets oh. made with all the clips and everything. That was so neat. <laughs> was, I mean, you know, I still look back and when putting together that little Instagram post, I had to go through all my pictures on my phone and, like, just find everything. And, you know, it took me down memory lane, too, and just how fun it was and how fun it was to, like, buy a little dress for, for Penny for the movie premiere and, like, some little things like that are the things that I really remember and that are so special. Aww. But, you know, the movies have been amazing. I don't write books for the movies, 
but certainly it's amazing when they turn into movies because it also it sells more books, right? <laughs> and I really just want the books to be in the world because that's my big dream. But the, both experiences were surreal and wonderful. I remember bawling my eyes out on the set of Everything, Everything. The first time I saw the actors speak the lines, I just cried and cried and Penny was there. And I remember I had like the, the headset on and, and she was like, why is mama crying? And David was there and David said, those are tears of joy, honey. And like now it's a thing in our household. <laughs> Many years later, like, you know, if she'll be crying for something, sometimes she's like, those are tears of joy, mama. <laughs> and it's just like, Aww. okay. But I mean, it was, it was so good to get to show her that you can make art, you know, like, and it can turn into something else. Like you don't, there isn't only one path to success because I thought that for a long time when I was in corporate America, like I didn't think I could make a living being artistic. And it was lovely to show her that, you know, like you can, you can make things sweetheart and they can, and and even if they don't become big, but you can still do it. You know, this is a path. And that was really important to me. And I was really happy that she could see that. That's amazing. Well, I'll be waiting for her books. I'll save her a slot in like 20 years or something. Yeah. (laughs) There's no way. If she gets like a lawyer, I'll be like more shocked than anyone. (laughs) Have you started another book or are you, are you going to focus mostly on publicity for a while or what's your, what are you up to? No, I have, I am writing, I finished actually a book during 2020, crazily, a a first draft anyway, which is not to say it's a book. It's still just a draft (laughs) because it's not good yet. And then I wrote another book that's coming out in June with five other women called Blackout. And I started something else just recently, but I'm kind of taking, that's going much slower because I'm in publicity sort of, let's talk about this book mode. And it's hard to do both at the same time. Wow, that's exciting. So what's the name of the one that's coming out next? Oh, it's called Blackout. No, not the one with five women, the other one. Didn't you say there was... Oh, yeah, but that one is like, that's still just mine. Like, I haven't shown it to my agent yet. Oh, you're kidding. I finished it. (laughs) So I'm very excited, but, you know, she hasn't even seen it yet. Oh, okay. She hasn't been able to tell me it's terrible yet. I'm sure it's not terrible. (laughs) So what advice would you have for aspiring authors? So there's a couple of things, like there's the practical thing and like the more philosophical thing. So the practical thing is writing is miserable sometimes. (laughs) So what happens to me is I start off really strong. So I have this idea and I'm like, yes, and I'm just writing and writing. And then I get to the middle and the middle is where all the doubt creeps in because you're not sure that it's worth writing this book. You're not sure about the ideas that sent you down this path you're 100% sure it's terrible. And I call it the wide open, the ocean of the middle. And that's where most of the doubt is. And my advice is just get through it. Just get to the end, get through the first draft. It, self-doubt is part of the process, which is the hardest thing to really, really know because it still feels terrible when you have all that doubt, but the doubt is part of the process. You just gotta get to the end. The thing I always say is I don't have a career because I'm good at first drafting. I have a career because I'm good at revision, right? Which means you got to get to the end so you can make it better. Like I'm almost desperate to get to the end so I can fix it, but you can't fix nothing, right? So you just have to get through it. And then my sort of more philosophical advice is I think the world is very good at putting people into boxes, right? And saying, you're supposed to like this. And you're supposed to be like this and do these things. And I think that's all nonsense, right? You get to be you, like the individual you. And all the things that are weird and quirky about you are the things that actually make your writing interesting, right? So all the parts that you sort of want to hide away from the world, you got to go in. You got to get in there. That's what makes you interesting. Like if I give a room of 50 students the same idea, I'll get 50 different stories, even though it's the same exact plot, right? And it's what's interesting is the thing that makes you, you. So let your freak flag fly. It's not <laughs> philosophical. <advice. laughs> Just it. fly my flag, leave it. 
Oh, amazing. Well, Nicola, thank you. It was so lovely to talk to you. I'll be thinking of you now for a while because I'll be plowing through your movies and I'm really excited about that. So thank you. you. And And the uh, books, of course, you know, I will get accompanying books, not just to watch the movie, but you're a wonderful, as you know, wonderful writer. And it's been a joy to hear about your process and everything. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure. All right. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to part of my June book blast. I hope you enjoy it. Come back tomorrow for more. Thanks again to today's sponsor, the Baby Trend Cover Me 4-in-1 Convertible Car Seat. Don't forget to enter my giveaway and the winners will be announced at the end of this week. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.